Sharks are some of the most magnificent, powerful, and misunderstood creatures on the planet. I want to share with you my experience, which was magic to me, and I hope will help you to see the beauty of our world, the beauty surrounding us. All we have to do is open our eyes and our hearts. It was through my contact with these extraordinary creatures that I began to feel and understand that we, people and sharks and elephants and wolves, the whole huge and incredibly beautiful world around us, are truly part of a magnificent whole, a whole that is as much a part of us as we are a part of it. Are you afraid of sharks? Most likely you are. I was afraid too. But what if I told you that those often peaceful looking jellyfish kill over 100 people each year? That scorpion stings annually take the lives of 5,000 people and more than 50,000 people a year die worldwide from snake bites. Compare that to the 50 to 70 confirmed shark attacks every year worldwide and the 5 to 15 annual shark attack fatalities. This is confirmed, widely available data on the internet. You can see it for yourself. All of my prior knowledge about sharks was based on commonly accepted perceptions or misperceptions, which in turn are based more on gossip and speculation than anything else. My understanding was that these creatures had only one goal, attack and eat. In short, I was very cautious about sharks, not unlike most people who have the same stereotypical feelings, either because they don't have a chance to learn more about sharks or having the desire to learn anything more. Sometime in the 1990s, I had my first opportunity to dive in the open ocean, the Pacific. I was a bit nervous. There were sharks, I was told. So I asked other divers, what about sharks? The other guy started laughing and told me that if I saw a shark, I would have to tell them about it because it didn't happen very often. They were right. During the two and a half days of the expedition, I did 13 dives and bumped into a shark just once. He was resting in a small cave and totally ignored me. Such a disappointment. All my preconceived notions about this bloodthirsty predator evaporated. What was I supposed to do now? My first real close-up and personal acquaintance with sharks took place in Socorro, which is located in the Pacific Ocean approximately 250 miles south of Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, at the tip of the Baja Peninsula. There lies a tiny island, Roca Partita, divided rock, which is actually the top of an underwater mountain. It measures approximately 300 feet long and 26 feet wide. Our dive instructors consider dives there as near suicidal, due to strong and unpredictable underwater currents, serious heavy surf, and the fact that the island is 200 nautical miles from the nearest shore. Were you to be carried out by the rough surf into the open ocean, which is very open indeed, your chance of survival would be minimal. All that said, when you go underwater at Roca Partita, it is amazing and there are many, many sharks, mostly silky, white tip and silver tip sharks. It is strictly forbidden to touch marine life and most of the divers there do respect that rule. But one of my friends couldn't resist the temptation and decided to pet one shark's tail. It was very turbulent underwater and I had to hold onto a rock to steady the video I was shooting. I didn't even notice that my left palm and fingers had been sliced by the razor-sharp polyps which grew on the rocks. About 30 feet below me there was a group of Galapagos sharks and they started slowly swimming up to my level. My friend and I decided not to push our luck and get out of there, fast. But suddenly I noticed a strange brown liquid oozing from my left hand. It was blood. What now? Well, despite our innocent provocation, none of the sharks attacked me, even though those Galapagos sharks are very serious guys and not to be trifled with. My next encounter with sharks was in the Bahamas on Providence Island, 
and its world-renowned dive operator Stuart Cove, whose major attraction is shark diving. Safety rules there are super simple. Don't stretch your arms because sharks may take that as an indication you're feeding them and they might nip you. I asked the instructors if there had been any accidents. One woman diver said that a while ago a shark nipped her hand, but that it was not an attack per se. Instead she pointed out since sharks don't have hands and fingers, they explore the world around them by nipping. My take from all of this is that nipping is not a rare event, but under no circumstances should it be considered as aggression. It is merely shark curiosity at play. We were keen to make videos about whale sharks, and so we went to Belize for that. Whale sharks are the largest fish in the world. They are breathtakingly beautiful, absolutely harmless, and feed on plankton, fish roe, or small fish, just like whales. To lure the whale sharks from the depths, we were making air bubbles in the hopes that they would mistake them for fish roe. But nothing happened. But we were rewarded by a small group of dolphins that appeared from out of the blue, spent a few moments with us, and then swam away. It was an amazing moment. Still tracking down whale sharks, we decided to go to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Some time ago, whale sharks were on the brink of extinction because they were being slaughtered for their fins. In some Asian cultures, there's an antiquated belief that shark fin soup provides enormous power to those who eat it. This old wives' tale has no more basis in fact than another barbaric belief, namely that a tiger's paw gives tigers courage to those who consume them. Sadly, however, because of the market demand for shark fins, up to 100 million sharks are brutally killed worldwide every year. Fortunately, the Mexican government has taken steps to protect sharks. In fact, some local fishermen have transformed themselves into tour guides, taking tourists onto the ocean where they can swim with these beautiful, amazing creatures. But most of all, I was yearning to see and meet great white sharks. They are the largest predators in the sea, except for sperm whales and killer whales. Guadalupe Island lies 150 miles offshore of the Pacific coast of Mexico, south of San Diego. We arrived at the island one day after departing in the evening. The ship's crew began preparing the shark cages for the divers and all the rest of the diving gear. Dives would start the next day and we couldn't wait. For many of us, it would be our first acquaintance with the great white shark. How would it all go? Would the sharks even show up? After all, this was the ocean and there were no guarantees. There never are. The next day came soon enough. It was gloomy on the surface and underwater it was even gloomier. The water was cold and my 5mm wetsuit turned out to be too thin. And we were waiting, waiting, waiting for sharks but they were nowhere to be seen. I was thinking, if the great whites prey on sea lions, would sea lion-like calls attract them? Maybe this would be a solution. Since I could speak through my mask, I began imitating the sounds of a sea lion to the best of my vocal abilities. Believe it or not, suddenly, there they were. Our first visuals of the great white shark. Everybody was crazy with excitement. This shark was huge. 
never in my life had I been next to a 16 foot long predator weighing a ton. I had no doubts about the protection that the shark cage offered and was not too worried about a shark attack. But I wanted to shoot a video from the closest distance possible. So there I was, leaning out of the cage as far as I could and stretching my arms as far as I could. When I'm taking underwater videos, the only world I can see is the one that appears in a tiny camera monitor, and so I could easily miss a nuclear submarine passing by if it were not in the camera's view. Or another shark. Wouldn't you know, I was following one shark to finish a scene, and when I was done, there was another shark almost under my armpit. Oops. <laughs> At day's end, I hadn't noticed how fast the first day of diving passed. It was strange, but the name Jack jumped into my head as the name I should bestow on that giant fella I'd met early in the day. Good night, Jack, I said to myself. I'll see you in the morning. I was also thinking about the seal sounds I made to attract Jack. That first day's experiment was promising, but I was not sure what exactly attracted the shark, my vocal talents or something else. I'm an engineer by profession, and we engineers generally do not live in a world of assumptions. We require substantiated evidence. It was obvious to me, though, that Jack didn't show up for food. A piece of tuna was hanging outside the cage for the whole duration of the dive, about 45 minutes. Jack bit at it only at the very end of his visit. Our crew didn't chum at all. They did not want to make false promises to the sharks, and thus avoided provoking them, which is a good thing. Simply a piece of tuna and nothing else. There were two submersible cages underwater simultaneously, one with four divers and another one with two. A third cage was attached to the vessel. Was Jack investigating a crowd? In this case, he would have spent more time around the cage with more people. Finally, I had the opportunity to dive in the small cage just by myself. In the cage opposite me were four divers. It would be a clean experiment. So I started my routine, the imitation of seal sounds. And it worked. Jack was spinning around my little cage like a small puppy dog spinning around your legs, and he was very close to me. I leaned out of the cage up to my vest with my arms stretched to their whole length and was taking a video. It was stunning. I was meeting Jack on the left side of the cage, following this magnificent creature as it was passing by, and as soon as Jack's tail disappeared from the camera view, I would quickly turn to the left, and Jack's head was already there, and he was spinning and spinning and spinning. It is a well-known fact that sharks usually make three circles around prey before attacking it. Jack made many more than three passes. It was clear that Jack didn't plan to attack me. If he had wanted to, he would have been able to reach me with a single stroke of his powerful tail and could have easily sliced me in half. All Jack was doing was entertaining himself, amusing himself, and satisfying his curiosity, trying to figure out what that strange creature was inside the cage. To Jack, I was not a regular diver. They always make lots of air bubbles and light flashes. This new creature in the cage was singing, a new twist to the show. I'm confident that animals are able to sense the emotions of other creatures. Dogs can feel your mood or your fear. Jack was sensing me and my presence and emotions. When he was swimming toward me or passed by, I was telling him from inside my mind that I admired him and that he was so magnificent and such a beautiful shark. Maybe that was the reason he spent more time around me. A positive attitude attracts everybody, cats and sharks and people too. The expedition lasted four days. There were two dives in the morning and two in the afternoon. Each time a dive ended, as soon as I got out of the cage, I was rushing to change the battery in my camera, 
drink a couple of cups of hot coffee, warm up a little bit, and then jump into another cage. In all, I was spending about six hours a day underwater, and in most cases was meeting up with Jack, the great white shark. My great white shark. Each time, this magnificent predator had many opportunities to attack me or the instructors who were outside their cages. It didn't happen once. Looking back now, ever since I began shooting underwater videos, my perception of marine dwellers, the ocean, and nature as a whole has changed a lot. Now I can clearly see their magnificence, beauty, and intelligence. I'm an engineer not only by profession, but also by the whole of my essence. I see the world as a perfectly thought through system. In this system, everything has its own purpose, from microscopic creatures to gigantic ones. If we are unable to see the meaning or purpose of the existence of something in the world surrounding us, it is only because we ourselves may not be able to figure it out, at least for the time being. But we eventually do. We have that awakening, that epiphany. Diving with great white sharks became a key point of my inner awakening, my epiphany. Instead of perceiving nature and the animal world as a mere food chain or hierarchy where mankind places itself on top, we can learn to comprehend our place in nature as very complex and multifaceted, a system where each element is of the same high importance. The world around us is not created to fill our needs alone. It exists on its own, and we humans should respect and cherish it. Does it matter how Jack came to this world, whether as a result of evolution or created by God? Why Jack, the great white shark, is here in his natural ocean environment is an obvious fact. And like you and me, he is a very important being. He lives his life. He has his emotions. He can feel pain. He can be bored and need some entertainment, just like all of us can. We all grew up indoctrinated to believe in the image of great white sharks as the deadliest and most dangerous creatures in the ocean killer sharks. This perspective could not be more removed from reality. Are you still scared of sharks? <laughs>